Hi, thanks for coming to our YouTube channel. We're grateful for the opportunity to connect with you, whether you're a regular here at LBCC, a fellow follower of Jesus, or perhaps you're someone just looking to learn more about him, more about what Christianity is about. Our aim is simple as a church. First, we want to connect you to Jesus, the God who's alive. And in doing so, we want to connect you to others because community is God's idea. As, as you're connected, we want to help you grow in your faith. We want every person to have a dynamic relationship with God through Jesus. And when you have that, you'll find that you're on a journey of faith and you can join in others and walk in that path together. And lastly, we want to help you find ways to invest your life. It's proven fact that people are better off when they're part of something bigger than themselves. And we want to help you invest your life so that you can make an impact on the lives of others. Whether it's at your home, your work, your neighborhood, your, your city or town, we want to see you make an impact on the lives of others and know that your life counts. So this morning, we hope you are uh, encouraged by the sermon. But uh, before we get to that, there's uh, just a few announcements to let you know of some things that are uh, going on here at the church. Thanks for tuning in. Although the pandemic has limited some of our activities, there are still ways to connect, grow, and invest at Long Branch Covenant Church. We host breakfasts for women and men on the second and fourth Saturday mornings each month. You can sign up at lbcovenant.org slash welcome slash upcoming dash events. Also, check out our life groups, a great way to meet and to get to know us better. Most of them meet on Zoom a couple times a month. And of course, visit our website or call the office at 732-870-2028 to get info or ask for prayer. We'd love to help you in any way we are able. Now, here's today's sermon. This is day three of looking at John's Gospel, and we've looked at chapter 14, 15, and 16. Oh, we're going to look at 16 this morning. And uh, I just have to draw your attention to that slide. That is the work of a young woman who actually lives in Central America that I met at a conference, and she does most of my graphics, if not all of them. And uh, she does really good stuff. Um, and very reasonable. Sometimes I feel guilty. Andy, if you're watching, it's okay. I make up for it. Yeah, so um, this morning we're talking about the Holy Spirit. Remember way back when, when I talked about the um, look at this, how we walk through this. I think this is the fourth one, isn't it? Yeah, it's number four. The third one on the, on the, the Gospel of John, those particular, those particular uh, chapters. And I, if you remember, if you have a really good member, rem remembrance, yeah. If you have a really good memory, you go back to when I talked about Luke and Acts and I described what I was going to do with Luke and Acts, and it was going to be a balloon ride. In other words, we were going to take a long, slow look of, of those two books, those two writings that belong to Luke, which I think are really two parts of one writing, uh, it, when you see the trajectory of it. And I also showed you a picture of an Amerindian woman that I met 40 years ago, believe it or not, 41 years ago. And her husband was ba basically my, my driver for most of the times I visited Guyana all through the 80s, which was probably a dozen times or so, maybe more. We took teams there to do some building and everything. But Bridget was an Amerindian woman and her sister knew even more than she did about natural healing. And basically what we did was we went for a walk on a trail. Um, well, I ran while they walked. The, and uh, I perspired quite a bit through it all. But they were pointing out all the different things along the path that were useful medicinally. How this would help this, and this would help that, this is what we do for this. And it was just really an amazing insight into it. And, you know, when you have a guide that really knows the land and understands uh, all these uh, cures, I guess, or, or things that they'll use to help their bodies grow and stay from harm. 
Uh, it was pretty amazing. And so, in contrast to that balloon ride, what we're doing with John chapter 14, 15, and 16 is we're really coming down and doing that. We're looking at some of the particulars about the great story or the big story that we see in Luke and Acts. Remember, Luke starts in the back hills of Judea with, with uh, Zacharias and Elizabeth, and it ends up in Rome with Paul preaching the gospel at the book of Acts. And we took four weeks basically just to fly over that and just looking at some of the, the things that are out there. And we really didn't come down and take a close look. So what we're doing now is we're, we're coming down to the part that Jesus is talking to his disciples. The first half of John, um, depending on where you see the first half end, I, I think it ends at chapter 13, was the gospel or the, the book of signs where Jesus performed many signs. And John is, remember, he's, he's picking out things that tell a story, that give us some insight into something. And then the second half of John, which picks up in chapter 14, is the book of glory. And John, and John starts to rehearse the things that Jesus talked about that bring glory to God. And um, so we're, we're walking through John's gospel now. We're, this is what we're doing as we see this. We're, we're walking through the book of glory. And Jesus is giving instructions to his disciples. Remember, chapter 13 ends with Jesus washing his disciples' feet. Um, <clears throat> Judas goes out, leaves to do his bidding with, with the Jews. And now, now we're coming to Jesus, getting his disciples, and he's giving them his last instructions before he goes to the cross. This is the picture that we're getting. And personally, I don't believe John's gospel is chronological entirely. I think this part certainly picks up the chronology of the last days of Jesus. But the first part of John isn't so. I, th I don't believe it's so, not all of it. I think some of it is structured that way. But uh, I think when it looks at the signs, you'd know this is the first sign, so on. But there's other things in there. This part is Jesus' last discourse with his disciples before his resurrection. Now, we know that he spent 40 days with his disciples after. So what you have to do is put yourself not in the, in the disciples' place on the day of Pentecost, which is 40 or 50 days after his resurrection. You're, you're putting yourself in the place of, we've just walked three years with Jesus. We've seen him do all these miraculous things, but we still have some doubts in our heart about who he is. We still don't know everything that he stands for. We, we don't recognize all these things. And so what John does is he gives us this, this picture of chapter 14, if you remember, is focused on the Father. Now, let me just build a fence around that and say that not only does he mention or focus on the Father, but he mentions himself in relationship to the Father, and he also mentions the Holy Spirit. But really, if I were going to pick a key phrase in chapter 14, it would be, no one comes to the Father but through me. That no one can get to the Father through me, uh, except through me. Did I say that right? Yeah. And th that would be the focus of it. The focus of it, Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and I mentioned that you could say that, that that verse could actually be translated, I am the truthful way to life. That would be a, a bona fide uh, translation of those words just because of the construction in the Greek. So the, the point of it is, and this is the point John's going to make, is that the Father is the point. Getting back to the Father is really what it's all about. And we're not only going to get back to the Father, but now with the rest of our life here on earth, we're going to glorify the Father. And that's what he talks about in chapter 15. 
By, by this is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit. And apart from me, you can't do anything. If you are not part of the vine, if you're not one of the branches that's still attached to the vine, you can't do anything. You have to be, you have to be tied to Jesus. You have to be in this relationship to Jesus. And that, that's the, the focus of chapter 15. I'm the vine, you're the branches. Apart from me, you can't do anything. My Father is glorified when you bear much fruit. This is how you bear much fruit. You keep my commandments. What are my commandments? That you lay your lives down for one another. Because my commandment is that you love one another. And so his fruit is that we, how we relate to one another, how we interact with one another. In, a, in, a, in an individualistic culture, that doesn't re resonate with us. In an individual culture, that doesn't resonate with us. We, we want to know how I can do this on my own. Yeah. And we don't seek for the collective body of Christ to hear God together. We always think, what does this mean to me, rather than what does this mean to us? Yeah? The first century church, especially in Judea, was an us community. They were a we community. They were not an I community. They thought in terms, what's good for my family? Or what's good for my group? American culture, and I don't blame it all on America, I think it started with the Protestant Reformation, it became very clearly an I culture. God has a will for me. But you know what? Here, to his, oh, bear my soul right here. I can't fulfill the will of God without you. Yeah, let that sink in, just kind of. I cannot fulfill the will of God for my life without you or some other group of people. I have to be connected to the vine. Yeah? Good. Glad most of you agree. Yeah. You see, we are an us. We're made up of individuals, but what our culture has made us to be individualistic and not corporate in our mentality. Yeah? And so we, we usually function, what's the best thing for me? Not, not what's the best thing for us. What's going to help us? Remember, a friend is someone who looks out for the welfare of another. And I didn't even get into the whole idea last week of virtue in friendship. And that virtue is a very important part of friendship. And it's a person who is good because of virtue that looks for other people who are good and virtuous. And it's, it's the connection between them that virtue becomes stronger and you base your relationships on virtue, not on material wealth or position or getting things, but because virtue basically is good and God smiles on good. Okay. I don't want to go off and preach on that, but it seemed like, seemed like the thing to do. Okay, chapter 16 is about the Holy Spirit. And I was going to do this on, on a different program just so that we could read the whole thing. But it, he is the spirit of truth. And, and Jesus says this in, in verse 9. He says, but when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own initiative, but whatever he hears... 
He will speak and he will disclose to you what is to come. He will glorify me for he will take of mine and disclose it to you. Now I can't tell you how many different ways that I have heard this verse interpreted that makes something inside of me, my baloney meter just goes right over. Like, that is baloney. You all know you have a baloney meter. Yeah. And as long as you keep that thing functioning, it'll work for you. And the secret is you have to follow, you have to zero in on truth in order to know baloney. Yeah. I think all the bologna sandwiches I ate when I was a kid. But your bologna meter, basically, when you hear something that goes, whoa, bologna. You understand I'm being nice. <laughs> Jesus calls him the spirit of truth when he comes. He will guide you. He will instruct you into all truth. People think that means I don't need anybody else. All I need is the Holy Ghost. Now, Paul was a dedicated teacher. Was he out of the will of God if they didn't need him? He spent two years teaching one particular group of people, and he told the Ephesians that I have disclosed to you the whole counsel of God. It seems like he would have been necessary. It just so when you come up to two scriptures that do this, you got to you got to sort things out and see what what's the real meaning of this. Now, I believe that when you you are filled with the Spirit, you have direct access to the God, and I'll show to God, and I'll show you how this works. If you back up a couple of verses. In chapter 16, in verse 9, he says this, that he will come and concerning sin because they do not believe in me. He will convict the world concerning sin because they, will not, they do not believe in me. That's chapter, uh, verse 9 in chapter 16. He says the Holy Spirit is going to come. Let me back up a step and just say, it's good for you if I go away. Now, the disciples are in, in a state of disillusionment. I should have laid this out in the beginning. After every one of these sections, the disciples are like questioning. What's he talking about? What's going on here? And they are disillusioned. He says, Do, don't let your hearts be troubled. Well, he knew their hearts were troubled because he was saying things. And then he said, I have to go away. I have to go away so that the comforter, the advocate, the attorney, however you want to translate that word, parakletos, is going, he won't come. Unless I go, I can't send him to you. And then he says, when he comes, he's going to convict the world concerning sin. Because why? They don't believe in me. And he says this, he says, and concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you no longer see me. And then he goes on to say, and concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world has been judged. So there's three things the Holy Spirit is going to do. He's going to convict the world concerning sin because they don't believe in Jesus. And then he's going to convict the world concerning righteousness because I go to the Father and you no longer see me. And then he says, I'm going to convict the world concerning judgment because the ruler of this world has been judged. Now, those can seem, and I think they are, they're kind of mysterious statements that he makes. But then he says, when the Holy Spirit comes, he will guide you into all truth. Okay, what truth? Concerning sin, concerning righteousness, and concerning judgment. This is what the Holy Spirit has come to do. He's come to now give us something to, to go after. 
And we have to understand that, that, that this is, in my estimation, from Jesus' own mouth, this is the purpose of, of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Now, there, there were a bunch of things happening. I was just explaining to a young woman this week about, about speaking in tongues and what happened on the day of Pentecost. It was a pretty miraculous event. The Holy Spirit showed up to uh, the 120 that were gathered together. This was the day of Pentecost, the Jewish feast. So there were people from all over the Mediterranean and the, the diaspora, those who were dispersed under the Assyrians and those who the Babylonians sowed out. So these Jews were coming from all over the, the Roman Empire to Jerusalem to celebrate the Feast of Pentecost. And when Pentecost came, the Holy Spirit fell on these believers and they all started to speak in tongues. And what was the miracle? They were speaking in languages they had never learned, but they were distinguishable or, or uh, understandable by those who were gathered. And they said, what is this that's going on? We hear them speaking in our own dialect. So it tells you this, that the Jews had been Hellenized into their, their surroundings. But now God comes, shows up, and they start declaring the things about, about Jesus. And it, it, it's a terrific story again where, where <clears throat> Peter steps forward and he preaches the gospel and he basically points to the, the resurrection of Jesus and telling them that they killed him, that you crucified him, but God raised him from the dead. He said, death couldn't hold him. It's a great phrase. And he was raised from the dead. So these, these three passages, they coincide with another one of John's, John's passages or one of, one of John's writings. And this, to be honest, this was the first sermon that I preached to Community Gospel Church in 1974. Forty, forty-seven years ago. And I was doing what we call hermeneutics. And the part of hermeneutics between observation and interpretation is a bridge called interpretive questions. And so I started to look at this passage and say, where else in the scripture does... Is there anything that relates to this, that confirms this? And it actually comes from Revelation chapter 1, beginning in verse 4 and going through verse 6. John wrote this. He said, John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, that is Turkey today. These seven churches are on the western side of Turkey. He says, grace to you and peace for, from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits who are before the throne. Now, everybody know that the book of Revelation is a book of symbols, pictures, yeah. He says, and from Jesus Christ. Now listen, he calls him the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. To him who loves us, not loved us, loves us and released us, not releases us, but released us from our sins by his blood. Yeah? So he calls Jesus, I mean, for, from him who is, who was, and is to come, that's God. That is the Godhead. <clears throat> we could say that's the Father. That is the I am. That's the one who has no past, no future, just is. Him who, it, he who is, was, and is to come. The seven spirits before the throne. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness. Then he says this. And he has made us to be a kingdom, priest to his God and Father. To him be the glory for, and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So what, what does this mean now? What is a faithful witness? What is this person 
Or what is this identity that he calls Jesus the faithful witness? And what does it mean that he calls Jesus the firstborn from the dead? That one might be a little bit easier. And the ruler of the kings of the earth, that he is triumphant over all of the kings of the earth. This is the one who is the ruler. This is who Jesus is. Now, you go back to convicting the world concerning sin, righteousness, and judgment. Those three titles for Jesus tie to each one of those things. A faithful witness, I believe, is a prophetic witness. I believe that a faithful witness is one who stands up and declares the will of God even when everything is going against him. Because it's one thing to be a witness, but it's another thing to be a witness under, under duress or under challenges or under persecution. He calls Jesus the faithful witness. And if you want to look at how to witness, just look at Jesus. He's the faithful witness. He's the one who declares the things of God and he does it without, without shame. I was thinking of this the other day, you know, Stephen was the, was the victim of one of the first cancel cultures. Yeah? Basically, he just told it like it is. Behold, in front of this whole, no one said, hmm, why don't we go search that out and see if he's right? No, they just killed him. Stop him from talking like that. And this is what happens, and you'll see this in, in John's gospel when he starts talking about persecution, that, that it really doesn't apply to us at this stage in our, in our experience. But when we look at convicting the world concerning sin, that is the work of the faithful witness. You see, and if, if the Holy Spirit is in you and is going to guide you into all truth, he's going to guide you into being a faithful witness. Because if this is who Jesus is, and we are tied to the vine, and we're going to bear much fruit, then we're going to have to let the Holy Spirit make us a faithful witness. See, sharing the gospel or being a witness for Jesus is not dependent on your psycholo psychological um, makeup. Well, you know, extroverts are really good at this. If you get an extrovert on fire about anything, that's all they could talk about. Doesn't matter what the subject is. If they're on fire, they're going to talk about it. You know, I use Simon Brace. Some of you know Simon. He's been here a couple of times. Simon is both an evangelist and an extrovert. He is a terrible administrator. Simon, sorry, I'm just, I just told the rest of the world that... that I don't think it's a secret to anybody. But no matter where you go with Simon, no matter what your purpose is, when he meets someone that he thinks is not a Christian, he's going to share the gospel with them. Even when you have a timely appointment to get to. To him, it's the most important thing that he has to do right there. But does that excuse people like myself who would rather just go sit down in the corner, read a book, or just read my email on my iPad and be left alone. Does that exclude me? Because that's not my temperament. No. no. If I want to be a faithful witness, I may have to work a little bit harder at seeing the, the opportunities. Let me back up. Looking for the opportunities. That I want to look for the opportunity. I want to survey this person's mind and life in order to guide them to see Jesus. You see, this is the work. If the Holy Spirit is here, it is not just so that we can experience the presence of God, which, again, I love to sense his presence. Theologically, I understand that God is everywhere, but there's a sense in which we say God showed up. Well, he didn't show up. He was there. He just made us sensitive. He opened the eyes of our heart to let us know what he was doing or that he was doing something. 
And most of the time, we don't know what he did. We just know it felt good. Yeah? Yeah, sometimes we know exactly what he did. If he heals somebody, has a word of wisdom, a word of knowledge for somebody, casts a, discerns demonic activity, casts out a demon, we, we definitely know something happened here. This was a God moment, something really worked here. But most of the time, we don't know, but it felt good. And you see, that, that's part of the Christian experience. But I believe that this is really the part of the Christian experience. That the, the faithful witness, if we're going to become like Jesus, let me back up a step and just say, if Jesus is the, the best illustration or the most perfect illustration of what it means to be a human and what it means to be a godly human, or what it means to be a person who is, is clearly representing who God is. Which I believe that's why God came to earth. To show us what humanity is supposed to be like. What it means to be a God-like person. And if that ruffles your theological feathers, I am not excluding his Godhead. I don't think Jesus did his deal or did his, 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 his stuff, his actions, out of his divinity. I think he did it out of his humanity. Because if he did it out of his divinity, I can never match that. But if he did it as a man who was filled with a spirit, filled with a spirit without measure, is the way we would say it. Where I am filled with the Spirit, but it is measured. He was totally different than that. But if, we, if he was convicting the world, so basically what you translate this, or what you interpret this statement as, that he was convicting the world concerning sin, um, as a faithful witness that basically we should be preaching Jesus. We should be, we should be declaring who Jesus is. And making that known, making, letting that be the, the banner by which people know us. That should be our witness to Jesus. Okay, second one is that he convicts the world concerning righteousness because I go to the Father. This one has to be unpacked a little bit more. What does this mean because he goes to the Father? Well, there's a man in the glory, we could say that. There's lots of men in the glory now because of Jesus. But when Jesus ascended to the, to the Father, it was to make propitiation, to make payment for our sins. Hebrews gives us the, the best illustration of this when he's talking about the, the, the Aaronic uh, priesthood. And he says in the Aaronic priesthood, the priest had to year after year, he had to enter into the veil with fear and trembling, wondering if his, the blood he was bringing was going to be acceptable by God for the atonement for the whole uh, tribe of Israel. And Hebrews says that Jesus didn't pass through the, the earthly tabernacle, but he passed through the heavenly tabernacle. That is, he passed through the heavens to present his blood before the Father for the redemption of all mankind. That what he did was he brought the atonement for our sins, not just for our sins, John says, but for the whole world. So the, the, the effectiveness of his sin is before the throne and accepted, and now he rules from that place. He stands there as the high priest who has no beginning and no end, but reigns forevermore. And he serves as our high priest that the, the payment for our sin has already been made. Even your future sin has been made. And that's for righteousness. We don't understand righteousness. There actually isn't a word 
in English that is, could be a word for word translation of the Greek word. And so sometimes this, this word is translated as covenant. Some, sometimes it's translated as justice. It's translated a number of ways. I'm glad God is a just God because he will accept forever the blood of Jesus. That ought to be a yes, sir. He will accept forever the blood of Jesus. That's because God is just. And he will convict the world concerning righteousness because when Jesus ascended, he wasn't seen anymore on the earth. He sent forth the Holy Spirit to represent or to now fill his disciples with the same insight and power that it was when they walked with him. You know, pre preachers often make jokes about, I wish I had tapes or the recordings of those 40 days, what Jesus talked to his apostles about in those 40 days. I mean, it, it's amazing. When Peter stands up, he knows the Old Testament like he's been in Hebrew school all his life. You know, he, he had insight into things. Well, he was with Jesus for these 40 days there, that Jesus taught them all those things. And after that, the Holy Spirit would guide them into all truth, all truth concerning these things, because they would wrestle with stuff. Acts 15 is one of those places where they wrestled with whether the Gentiles had to keep the law and be circumcised. And at the end of it, it says, we, it seemed good to us. Yeah? Other times they heard the Holy Spirit say, separate from me, Barnabas and Paul. I'm going to send them out to witness to the Gentiles. So you, you, you have these things that have to be put together. But we, sh we should have this understanding. And I, I started out by saying that we don't understand righteousness. We don't understand that when we confess our sins, he is what? Faithful to forgive us our sins. That's not because God is keeping a ledger book. It's because unconfessed sin eats away at our ability to be a faithful witness. Unconfessed sin is something that erodes our own confidence in the atonement. Even though we know it's there, we don't confess it in a real, in a real world environment. This is what, this is what, we, need, what we need to understand about, about righteousness, that God has made us whole. He has removed the shame of guilt. And I know that there, there are things that, I, there's still things in my life I wince at when I think of. When I think back of this, I, there's a wince that goes on in my spirit. And I think I have to bring it up to God. And I don't say, am I forgiven for this? I say, thank you for forgiving me for this. Because this in, in the real world has been already forgiven. The final one, he says, is that he'll convict the world concerning judgment because the ruler of the king, because he's the ruler of the kings of the earth. This is one of the, 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 the things that are there. Jesus said it that in, in, at the end of one of the chapters, he said, the ruler of this world has been judged. Already been judged. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians, if they would have known what they were doing when they crucified the Lord of glory, they never would have done it. They thought they were putting him to death. They were ending this threat. Like all the other threats had a, that had risen up before, they thought at this point that this was the end of it right here. But if they would have known what they did, that when he was crucified and raised again, he conquered death. He took all of the, the teeth out of the lion's mouth. He took all of the sting 
out of the scorpion's tail, that Paul could cry out, O death, where is your sting? What is there to fear? Because he has taken away all the things that would send us to an eternal torment, that would send us to hell, that would give us the fear of dying. Jesus has, has destroyed or defeated the ruler of this world. And he's had to let go all of his captives. Even those of us who walk in captivity today. You know, however you extrapolate that, however you feel the confidence to, to, um, to interpret that, that because he, he is the ruler of the kings of the earth. He's the one who is in charge of everything. And that doesn't mean that God does everything we like or everything that's comfortable to us. God's after one thing in us, and I believe it's fruit. And if you have the Holy Spirit, you have the fruit of the Spirit. And so God will do whatever needs to be done. Jesus said, if you bear fruit, he's going to prune you. I thought he would pet me. I thought he would say, well done, a good, good and faithful servant. No, he says, if you bear fruit, my father's going to prune you. He's going to cut your branches back. Why? So you bear more fruit. See, the world has a very different idea of what God should be like. And it, it's, it's preached all the time. It has a, the, the world has an ingenious way of just reversing or, or, or turning everything upside down or inside out, making bad good and good bad, and not understanding it. And it, re, it, it requires the church... Not just this church, but every church, every believer to understand what the purposes of God are. And that we are people who are able to, to walk in the spirit and be faithful witnesses, understand the righteousness of God, what God has done through Jesus, and understand that, that Jesus is in charge. Now, that doesn't mean what some people think it means. See, I believe that humans still have free will. I'll nail these colors to the mast. See, what brings God more glory? If God is a puppeteer over seven and a half billion people and pulls every string on everybody's life, or if God has to work with seven and a half billion people and still get his will done. Seven and a half billion people who have free wills. Which one brings God more glory? The Godfather kind of puppeteer? Or the one who can still work his will with seven and a half billion wills going, herding cats doesn't even describe it. And is still able to work all things together for good to those who love him and those who are called according to his purpose. I think the answer doesn't need to be said, but I think it's the latter. That brings God more glory. You think of God working through seven and a half billion free wills every day to accomplish his will and bring his purposes to pass. That's a smart God. I was being facetious there. You realize that was... That, that, that's a God who is in control. Does that mean you're not going to get a flat tire, never going to be late for something, not going to get sick, not lose your wallet? Does it mean all those things? No. We're still kind of stupid. <laughs> We're going to do dumb things. But God's going to work that dumb thing together for good to those who love him and those who are called according to his purpose. That the devil can't get his way with me because his way would be to send me to hell and be his captive forever. But because Jesus has defeated him, that fear should not be part of my life. 
Yeah? And he should be convicting us concerning judgment. That we should be led into that belief that Jesus is alive from the dead. Death can't hold him. He's taken the sting out of it because he's the ruler of the king of the earth. He's the prophet, the priest, and the king. The prophet brings the witness, the priest brings you to God, and the king rules from his throne. And so John has painted this picture of Jesus as a prophet, priest, and king, all symbolized in the Old Testament by fallible men, by men who were were prophets that didn't accomplish everything that God did, ran from, from things they never should have ran from, were unfaithful at times when they never should have been unfaithful, priests who didn't do their duty, priests who basically charged people for, for, for abdication or, or having their sins removed from their lives. There are there things that went on in the Old Testament. And here's my take on all of that. God was just showing that humans can't do it. God was just revealing that humanity could never get us to this place. That there's only one who could bring us to this place. And that was Jesus. That all of history focused in on this little town in Judea where Christ would be born. And had followed his life and he raised up disciples who would record the things that Jesus did so that we could see today what Jesus accomplished 2,000 years ago and promise us a future with him. And what we need to be, do is be, let the Holy Spirit guide us. Let him guide us into all truth. And certainly, there's all things that John doesn't talk about. He says that the, the world couldn't contain all the books if the, everything was written down about Jesus. He says there's a lot more behind this, but what we have to do is see what, what the Holy Spirit's primary purpose in our life is, and that is to guide us into truth. To guide us into the truth about Jesus as the faithful witness, as the, the high priest that lasts forever, lives forever, and as the ruler of the kings of the earth. That that's really the message of chapters 14, 15, and 16 of John's gospel. You have the Father as the one we're going to, Jesus, the one who connects us to him, and the Holy Spirit who teaches us all the things that Jesus has done. He said here in, in these verses, he said, the Holy Spirit won't speak of himself. He'll only speak of what he hears. You know, in, in the Athanasian Creed and the Nicene Creed, it talks about the Father being unbegotten, the Son being the begotten one, and the Holy Spirit being the one who proceeds from the two of them. And that's how we, we see this God who is unseeable. This is how we apprehend what he does for us. Yeah. So what, what, what's our job? Be a faithful witness to Jesus' life. Be faithful in that. Understand what he's done for us through righteousness and understand what he does through us by being the ruler. By being the ruler. See all those things. When you put this into perspective, go back and read the book of Acts now. And just see how those things unfold. Not just Acts, I'm sorry, Luke and Acts. And just see how all this stuff builds together. And how John is just pointing us back to the life of Christ. And even then, the life of the, the apostles. Amen? I'm going to let Tony come and Father, we thank you for this word. We thank you, Lord, that you, Jesus, you gave your life and you went back to the Father and brought to him the blood that makes, makes us righteous before him, Lord. 
And, for, and Jesus, we thank you that you sent the Spirit, that we could now be, be vessels of that Spirit to the world around us, that our words would bring the truth of the message to convict the, the, them of sin, Lord, and that our lives would be demonstrations of your righteousness, Lord, and our hearts would, would reflect constantly, Lord, that we know that indeed you have judged this world, Lord, and you bring, you bring your judgment and your rulership to this world and into our lives. Help us, God, to be faithful witnesses to this message you've given us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you today. Happy Mother's Day to all the moms, and don't forget to pick up your gift and your baby bottle on the way out.